Welcome to the first session of our Communities of Belonging Learning Series with our host, Michael Jones. In this series of generative conversations, Michael and his conversation partner will offer a richly textured and multidisciplinary examination of place. Throughout these conversations, we will be reminded that too often the places we create remain placeless because they do not include our stories. Today's session is entitled Homecoming, Gifts and Rootedness, Coming Home to the Wonder of a Place-Based World. And Michael has invited special guests Sophia Horwitz and Heidi Clellenzauer to join him. I'd like to welcome the host of the Communities of Belonging series, Michael Jones, to the session today. We are so fortunate to have Michael Jones as one of our Tamarack thought leaders. Michael is a leadership educator, widely recognized pianist and composer, and conversation catalyst who has been convening forums on the soul of placemaking beginning with the support of the BAMP Center in 2010. Michael is also the author of The Soul of Place, Reimagining Leadership Through Nature, Art, and Community, which explores how our relationship with place deepens our connection with the core energetic patterns that form the undercurrents of life. I would also like to welcome our special guests for today's call, Sophia Horwitz and Haile Clellan Sauer. Sophia is co-founder and partner in CoLab, a social impact agency that enables public participation in order to deliver strategic and tactical results in national, regional, and community-based projects. She has also presented a university program on sustainability leadership and developed and hosted a national conversation with the support of the McConnell Foundation on Canadian Placemaking Initiatives. Heidi holds a Master of Landscape Architecture degree from the University of Guelph. Her purpose is to bring the people to the land by helping to move sound scientific and local knowledge into the wise shaping of community and landscape. Heidi brings relationships with other species into her definitions of place and artfully trans translates local stories and soul of place into habitats of vitality for everyday wildlife, human life, and increased awe and understanding. We are so delighted to welcome you all and appreciate you taking the time to share your insights and experience with experiences with us today. I will now turn it over to you, Michael, to explore homecoming gifts and rootedness. Thank you, Christy. It's wonderful to, uh, to be, I appreciated your introduction and uh, it's wonderful to be with you all today and particularly delighted to have Sophia and Heidi with me as conversation partners because I do believe that the way we come to understand and experience places is through conversation and through stories. And so I thought I would begin with a story and a set of context for some of what we'll be exploring over the next, uh, the next hour together. Um, some time back, I was, had left college after studying classical music for many years and returned to Toronto, which was my home, and lived in a small apartment and didn't have access to a piano. So I looked around in my neighborhood to find a place where I might um, be able to continue playing. And found this wonderful dance studio, a modern dance studio, a few blocks away from my apartment. And they had a beautiful nine-foot concert grand piano sitting in this marvelous open space with natural light coming into the floor-to-ceiling windows. And uh, I came in and the dancers were working on the stretch bar. And I said, you know, I'm a pianist and I'm looking for some work. And the director of the school said, well, it just happens that we have an opening right now. We have a class tomorrow morning at 10. Why don't you come by? Um, I'll introduce you to Amelia, who's the teacher, and see what happens uh, between you and with the class. So the next morning I returned about a quarter to ten with a box of music, not being quite sure what I, I was going to be asked to do. And uh, as I sat that underneath the piano, and Amelia uh, drew the dancers into the center of the floor, she looked over to me and said, welcome, Michael. It's wonderful to have you here with us this morning. Um, and I just want to do some warm-up work for a few moments. Could you please play some music for us that has the feeling of rain? And I thought for a moment and said, hmm, rain. And I realized I play Bach and Beethoven and Chopin and Mozart, but I had not, to my knowledge, played rain. And so I went into my box looking for something like raindrops falling on my head. And she looked over and a little exasperated said, Michael, please, no, not, not music. I want something just has the feeling of rain. And she, as it turned out, she was also a pianist. So she came over and played in the upper notes. And I watched very carefully what she was doing. And as soon as she went back to the dancers, I immediately put my hands in the same notes that she had just played. And I began to play rain. And as I did that, something very magical happened. The 
dancers started to move out across the floor and started to do movements that were perfectly in tune with what I was creating at the piano. So as I began to forget myself a little and was not so self-conscious about what I was doing, I found that the music began to almost play itself in response to what I was feeling happening on the dance floor. And they in turn sort of felt as if their bodies were just responding in, 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 in tune with what I was doing with the music. And then Amelia called out and said, now play wind. And I said to myself, I think I'm just getting good at rain. <laughs> we had to move on. And so uh, she did something with her left arm to give me the sensation of, of wind. And I began to follow that. And then something much more dramatic started to unfold. As I opened up at the piano and the dancers started to open up their movements, we entered into this marvelous correspondence together. And uh, we're creating this very magical space um, through movement and music. And then she said, now I'll play thunder. And as soon as she said thunder, a memory came back that I had long since forgotten of my summers at a summer camp up in the, what, what at that time was the wild uh, areas, the near wilderness of Georgian Bay. And the summers I had spent there um, in, in, this, in, in, the, in this marvelously elemental environment that really over a period of time felt like home for me. And I can remember on a, on a muggy, sort of hot July afternoon, when I felt the first vibration of thunder under my foot, under my feet, I would go down to the camp lodge, open the screen wide, and I would then play to the storm. And as soon as she asked me to play thunder, all of those memories came back again. And I'd realize how marvelous it was to be in the presence of the ways in which I could be at home in this environment, held by the enchantment of what I was experiencing in the midst of everything that was happening around me. And I would play to the wind, and I would play to the rain, and to the marvelous stillness that we'd come to uh, as the storm began to recede into the distance, and the subtleties of the sensations I would experience in that moment. And I think that was my first experience, conscious experience, really, um, of, 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 of homecoming, of coming into a place and dropping down into a place that felt like home for me. And in a world where I think we're constantly being elevated into the sense of climbing the ladder of success, of growing up into maturity, that there's also a movement downward, a movement to, um, to come be, become native to the ground we find ourselves on. And it's often through our stories that we begin to make our home for ourselves in the world. And this story has been one that I've endlessly repeated. Zuela Cather, a wonderful American poet who's written some marvelous books on play, he says, we really only have two or three human stories, and we continue repeating those time and time again because they're stories of homecoming, stories of grounding, stories of coming back to the place in which we find ourselves most like ourselves, most true to who we feel our, our inner spirit really is. So with that story as an opening to a way of thinking about place, um, I'd like to invite Sophia to say a few words about her experience being in conversation with placemakers across Canada in a study she was completing, and what comes to mind in terms of what what is what is place and why is it so important now that we are having these conversations? And then I'd like to turn to Heidi to begin to build on on this in terms of how do we design places in our communities that invite us to come home to ourselves and to our our our, our place in the world. Sophia, that I invite you to come and join us. Great. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I think what you're saying just resonates so strongly around um, what matters and why when we wake up about our surroundings and who's around us that we can really make something meaningful together. Mm -hmm. so I guess this began for me when I was uh, I went on a learning journey last year um, to over 30 communities where I was connecting with stories and friends, old and new, um, and really trying to investigate kind of what made these places tick and come alive. And, um, we were traveling in a VW van across the US, Mexico, and Canada, and there was so much inspiration of um, small, medium to larger cities all figuring out what their kind of unique DNA is that uh, makes them come alive. And when I returned to Canada, I, I really felt, um, and where I am based right now in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, there was something missing about um, how we can be connected to each other and each other's stories across Canada and what would be possible if we actually were 
in relationship um, and in learning together. And something I believe strongly in around collective wisdom and uncovering that potential in every person and that there's more together was, I think, this work that I've been doing around place and placemaking, there's some untapped potential if we actually were in touch and working together across boundaries and silos and disciplines. Um, and the JW McConnell Foundation agreed very strongly, too, that this was an area that Canada had lots of great grassroots initiatives, but there wasn't something actually connecting our work um, across our regions. So what if we started to learn and look at the opportunities and challenges and stories and um, what was working in different places? Mm -hmm. And we Which did uh, interview. Yeah. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and then we got to do um, around 30 interviews uh, on the phone and then had a gathering in Montreal with around 40 placemakers from around North America. And we just had some really rich, uh, interesting conversations and discussions about both action and how do we scale the work we're doing uh, and how do we build capacity and study impact and share the stories out to the larger network and then how do we connect and learn from each other and share resources, and then how do we collaborate with government towards these shared goals um, and move towards advocacy and changing the conversation instead of different groups around economics and health and tourism. What if we all came together to talk about place as the connector uh, across all these differences? <clears throat> mm, lovely. So how could place be sort of the central gravitational pull in a sense? The primary connector yeah, in bringing us together in that way. And I remember you sharing when we talked earlier this week about your trip to Sicily and where you found that after in the afternoons everything closed up and people just strolled around mm -hmm. by the fountains in conversation. It seems to be that's an example of how place can be a connector, how the, the gathering yeah. together in place can connect us in that way. Yeah, and that slowing down, that I always think of when I've done placemaking projects in Halifax, one of the first steps is let's take a walk together and actually get to know the unlikely beautiful things about our place that in the everyday we might go just go unnoticed. So I love that tradition in Italy that that's just part of the culture. Everyone every evening goes out for a walk and at a very, very slow pace and <laughs> just appreciates and sees and be seen and hangs out on, on by the fountains and the benches. Beautiful, yeah. Uh, Judy, my partner, and I some years back traveled in, in a motor home, much as you were describing, and a friend, as we were trying to plan ahead, we'd call ahead to people we knew and said, you know, by the way, we're dropping into your region, we thought we might like to stay for a while. Nobody was calling us back. <laughs> so uh, a friend of ours said, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity to travel with a candle rather than a flashlight, and it transformed the entire journey for us over the coming months, and and we really saw the world as a place because we entered into this dialogue with our surroundings in a way that we would not have if we simply stuck to trying to follow our plan. And so we, in a sense, sauntered across America uh, mm -hmm. in that fashion of strolling. And uh, But being in conversation with the place itself kind of brought that alive for us. And I know, Heidi, that's been some of your work, I think, has been how we breathe life into our surroundings through being in dialogue with place mm. and uh, how we design places that really invite us to be in dialogue in that way. Mm -hmm. the, the invitation to come home is to be in that conversation. I wonder if you could share some of your reflections with us and we'll, we'll build on that. Indeed, and thank you. Thank you, Michael. Greetings, Sophia. Greetings, everyone. Um, yeah, the, the thought that just came to me as Sophia was speaking about taking a walk is that so often um, we move through our lives, our work, our families, our walks even, with our minds alone, with our heads, with ideas, and um, with our speech. And sometimes we actually forget that we are living in bodies. We're living in clay bodies that have senses. And um, I think that there's a way of knowing our bodies and our place in a sensory way that allows us to feel at home that we sometimes forget. Um, I'm really, really interested in how we can feel deep belonging when another person isn't there 
to share that with us or or when a program isn't necessarily in place to support us how can the place of our everyday lives itself hold us and help us feel a sense of belonging um, in Canada we are a people that gets moved around a lot um, whether it's on an everyday basis from our house to our workplace to our school places to um, caretaking places to the outdoors or whether it's historic um, through the movement of indigenous peoples or being moved for work or um, one of the defining features of Canada is, is immigration from faraway places both within the land of Canada and, and abroad. And so when you think about the population of Canada you realize that we are a people of movement of displacement and there's something about displacement that fundamentally creates trauma um, little ones big ones and different ones in between and we continue to live with those how can we design our communities and our places in everyday ways every way senses that hold us and help us feel belonging wherever we are right now um, Michael, maybe you want to just kind of go back and forth in this too. I don't want to um, just speak alone. Sure. But yeah. I was thinking of William Number Yates, uh, who, when he moved to London, uh, England, to write his poetry, he said when friends would go back to Ireland, he said, "Would you please go to the Sligo Shore and put some mud in a bottle and bring it home to me here in England?" Because mm. that, that brings me back to my sense of home again just by tasting and smelling the scent of the mud in the bottle. And how That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> this sense of displacement that we find our sense of place in, in interesting ways. But sometimes we find our home only through the absence of home. In the same we way remember that what we left, brought back to that, that memory for me. Yeah. Mm. And it was, as you said, it's more than just a mental concept. It was very clear for me to to be the rain and be, to be the wind. I had to play. I had to. It, was, it wasn't a concept or an idea. It was to feel the rain, to feel the wind. That opened up a musical vocabulary that has sustained me for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. And it all came, I think, from that that deep visceral connection to what home really felt like for me. So I wonder really what it is we can. Yeah, I was, Sophia and Heidi, I was wondering how we might think of our community as a place where we can offer a way of thinking about place that is an invitation to coming home. I think that your um, mentioning about bringing the soil is really uh, potent because sometimes we forget, again, that the soil is underneath us. Uh -huh. and, um, uh, you know, I think that if we design in ways that remind us of the soil, of the plants, of the animals, of the deeper land that's underneath us, mm -hmm. um, it's a resource that we've forgotten. And you spoke of a, a vocabulary of belonging, that you had found a vocabulary of belonging in your, uh, or of dialogue with your music, with, with um, experience through your music. I think that, that the kind of design that allows us to feel place, to feel belonging, to feel a sense of safety that we can just open up and become more of our inner self, I think that um, design can draw on those sensory things and on those biophysical things in ways that can expand our current vocabulary of building a neighborhood or a place of belonging mm -hmm. and deep in relationships, deep in the kinds of dialogues that we have beyond an exchange of ideas or just saying hello to a neighbor and actually involving other species and one another at deeper levels. Well, of friendship. Yeah. It's extending beyond, beyond the human world, isn't it, to the more than human world, to other species. It's the sense mm -hmm. of having a larger sense of where home is and what home means for us. And we tidy. forget that we belong to each other. Mm. Exactly, yeah. And Sophia, yes, as you were saying, maybe strolling or meandering is a way that makes mm -hmm. that possible. I just came back from the United Kingdom and you know, over there they have the ethic free to roam and you can roam everywhere on these footpaths. Mm. And they meander throughout the countryside and it's a way that you come back to ground. Uh, 
you grow down rather than up into the into participating in the countryside. Mm, and that reminds me too, this participation, how can we actually, in a culture where we've um, separated so many ways that make it feel like we can't actually influence or contribute to our surroundings, when systems and built environments seem so static, um, um, and, and a lot of bureaucracy to actually get anything done, I feel like place is this incredible and our local environments to actually make change and to um, tap into that yearning to contribute to something bigger than ourselves and to see impact and to connect to what's around us in that way mm -hmm. that we long for. Yeah, and the capacity. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I was just thinking. I'll uh, do a conversation on a webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Heidi, go ahead. Um, what Sophia is saying is just so, so important. Um, and I think when you talk about uh, connecting, we need to remember the sense of touch, that the way we make space, the way we space ourselves apart or near one another, has a lot to do with whether we even connect. In a place like England, streets in a village are very, very narrow, and the sidewalks are hardly wider than a single person. Hmm. A good designer of a neighborhood or of a campus or of a workspace will actually deliberately, if they're, if they're able to get through the bureaucracies to do so, will actually design things to be very narrow and close together. They actually design space so that we have to bump together. You know, mm -hmm. within our own houses, the favorite places tend to be the hearth or the kitchen table. And um, we can have as many rooms in a house as possible, but we have a tendency to want to gather together in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. How do we create kitchens, kitchen table encounters, kitchen table spacers in our neighborhoods and in our everyday places? And causing ourselves to bump into each other, mm. even if it's just for a few moments as we walk to where we need to go, creates an incredible shift in our ability to notice who is in our space that day, who we relate to, who's part of the rhythms of our everyday lives. Mm, I love that. Yeah. I think of it, I've often talked about it as the outside living room. How do we make the street and actually reclaim the streets that we say are for cars but actually make it fully for people? And what would it look mm. like and how would it feel if we actually turned those streets into the kitchens and living rooms and, uh, of our communities? And then mm -hmm. I've seen, for me, my big inspiration was in Latin America, in Havana, Cuba, and in Honduras, and the way that people cross the street to say hello to each other, the mm -hmm. way that people are playing chess on the sidewalk, the way that a, a family ceremony or ritual is happening but spilling out onto the street, and anyone passing by can just come on in. Um, and I was working with a, a local sociologist in, in Havana that uh, was taking a dilapidated garage and making it a cultural community center. And mm. the whole community was coming together and doing different workshops and music practices and a hip-hop recording group was doing their album there. And there was all kinds of health prevention workshops. It was just so alive and visceral that from the street um, to this old garage um, was the living room. It was fully alive and I was trying to understand what is it, how much is it the elements, the kind of fabric, urban design, and how much is it the social capital and relationships and the trust and those stories that actually bring us to life. Mm. I think it is really this kind of complex stew of elements that uh, makes it so rich and natural. Beautiful. Yeah, I do a lot of work in Texas and down there their kitchen table would be the front porch. Um, mm -hmm. And they mm. often talked about growing up on the front porch in their community. That's where their grandmothers and grandfathers taught them help them with their homework, it's where they shared the community stories, it's how they reimagined community. And yet there was a sense of loss and disconnection because the front porch had, had as it has for many of us, it had, had kind of dissipated. And I said, well, what happened? They said, well, we got air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> and down there, everybody went inside, you know, or they went out for a drive in an air-conditioned car. And they hadn't realized how much that eroded the quality of community life. Uh, and how do we, as you said, how do we bring the kitchen table or front porch conversations back into our communities so that, we, so that becomes our, our sort of public living space? 
And uh, also, you were mentioning earlier, Heidi, about the nature of touch. And I realized that what's helped me play the wind and rain is that I love playing Chopin. And for Chopin, everything he said at the piano is around the art of touch, the way in which you can subtly mold and shape the notes with the helpfulness of your hand. So you're not forcing and bending the notes. And I think that that's the attitude we can bring to the way in which we move in community is how do we allow ourselves to touch and be touched by and have that tactile sense in our community, a sensitivity to that, so so our buildings don't become kind of standalone edifices that don't carry stories and don't carry experiences and a sense of soul. Can we see our built environment or and our natural environment as extensions of the soul of community in that way? Mm. And and I when I was that. in England at um, at um, Schumacher College and. Heidi and I were both there for two weeks. Um, there, they're having a craft revolution. They're advocating the movement to craft in communities because maybe that helps us regain the language of, um, of touch through the ways in which we work with craft and also connects us to the land in a, in a creative way because craft comes out of the, out of the soil of the place we create from. Hello? Yes. I'm just pausing for a moment, Kirsty, because I think we can begin to invite others into our into our conversation. Absolutely. So we do have a number of people on the line. Uh, we do welcome you to, um, if you put up your hand, I can certainly unmute you and you can share your reflections, your stories, what's resonating from you. Oh, I see Michelle Friesen. All right. Hey, Michelle, are you there? Yes, I am. Wonderful. I have to be honest. I thought maybe I had my hand up, so I was thinking, oh, no, I better turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> I put you on the spot. I, I, would, I do want to share that... Um, I so appreciate some of the conversation, especially where you're talking about people getting beyond and thinking about place versus our various silos, programs, uh, and all kinds of things. And um, I appreciate that. My particular interest is uh, in my daughter who has some significant disabilities and us really looking at uh, place for her in where she can be more connected and more grounded and um, so I'm appreciating the conversation. Great, thank you Michelle. And I, I think that's so relevant to our time and to Canada in general when we have such a big problem with isolation and um, people feeling separate and so we need these kind of community initiatives and rituals to remind us of who we are and how we work together. Yeah. And having creating public places for conversations where people can gather, you know, for example, we have in our local park we have benches that they all look out on the water and I said, why don't we have benches that look to each other? Mm -hmm. Become natural kind of places where we can sit and enter into spontaneous sound conversations, particularly with strangers which I think is one of the ways we address the kind of social isolation and loneliness that's so prevalent. Where can you go for a good conversation in the community? Mm -hmm. that's, um, that comes from a deep, um, that a deep human impulse, I think, that um, we have a lot to learn from Indigenous peoples in the way that we use space socially. Yeah. Um, the idea of a council ring was was attempted to be brought into everyday community in the 1930s by a landscape architect called Jens Janssen, who was one of the first to really take seriously the idea that our everyday places are the places of glory, not the not the special ones that we set aside, not the special dishes or the special places or the iconic landscapes, but that there is power and beauty and health in our everyday plants, everyday landscapes, and in the people that have always been in this place. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of bringing benches to 
together to face one another has an ancient precedent in the council rings and in the sitting around the fire of peoples and over history around the world. And um, it's a timely moment for for all of us in Canada and beyond to bring that kind of gathering and new kinds of listening and vocabulary into our everyday spaces. Mm -hmm. And it's not with the material world that we build our sense of place. It's in the relationships that we have with mm -hmm. the that that material world holds, both human and non-human. And circles, rings, gathering for fire, gathering for dialogue, and really deep listening are, are the keys to making that happen. How can we design opportunity for that in our everyday spaces? And when you're doing that, you're really creating the opportunity for the life of the imagination to come into full flower, because uh, imagine mm -hmm. the imagination lives in this space between. Sophia, a thought you might have with that? Well, I'm, it's it's beautiful to hear, and I'm just picturing um, some of the conversations we were in in uh, this North End community in Halifax um, when we when we were working to create some traffic coming on a street, and we're looking at solutions, and the community said, in a very creative way, let's actually paint the intersection as a Mandela to celebrate who we are and what we represent in that story. Wow. And we be <laughs> and we began by speaking with children and and I think kids have this unique ability as well to not be clouded by barriers or the things that we can't do but dream really big and beautiful and wild and so we started with them to say what would you imagine here and what does that look like and what do you love about this place and and then we went to the seniors home uh, that was also quite quite isolated where 400 seniors lived in a high rise but didn't feel like uh, this neighborhood was actually a safe one because they just didn't know their neighbors. Mm. And so we started talking with them and and slowly having um, some mixing of different communities and then making flags uh, to represent what we loved about this place. And, and eventually this big celebration day of storytelling um, and a collective painting of a mural on the street. And afterwards now, all these different people go to each other. There's a lot more events at the seniors' home, and the seniors feel comfortable to walk around the neighborhood. And the kids slow down to tell friends and their parents about the story of when they painted the street and what that means to them. <clears throat> and just those bumping in collisions that are now happening there uh, and how it's changed this place is, is really profound. Mm. In some ways, it was so simple and also such a silly idea, but it, it has had some really big impact. Just with a simple question, like, what do you love about or what do you care about this place? Opens mm. up a, so many new possibilities. Yeah, and, and, that's and true. Yeah. That place, place based conversations often are healing conversations, I've found, because there, there, there are things we carry within us that are healed when we begin to talk about and acknowledge the love we have for the place we find ourselves in, mm. or the yearning we have to have to, to be of a place again. Um, a memory of something we had at one time that we that in one way we've lost. Yeah, Completely and that's free. a big. It's like a almost like a psychological shift at a very personal level from expecting other people to be the solvers of our problems and to look into ourselves and what our gifts and unique contributions are that we want to support something. And yeah. I feel like that little there's this little shift that can happen in people's minds and hearts, and then. There's so much more, and then we create an example of what we do, but then from there, it can create a ripple of change. Yeah, lovely. Heidi, when we talked earlier in the week, you shared something about gifts and how gifts, how we can create a sense of gifts in community and where we find gifts. Could you share a little bit about your thinking? Oh, uh, I can. I, I, yeah, my, my mind is spilling over with the ideas that you're each um, surfacing, and I'm sure the audience <laughs> feeling the same way. Um, I think it comes back again to not just the idea of um, belonging to a place, not just the idea of having a space or a house or an address there, but to actually embodying. The psychological shift comes from actually feeling like we matter, like we've been seen, like we belong. And um, before I mention the gifts, I just wanted to go back to that idea of coming together in the kitchen um, as an alternative to 
I think our lives sometimes, when we get in the car and we're really busy and we have to get the kids to school or, or get to work or whatever, our lives are at risk of becoming as linear as the wide roads we build in North America. Mm. And they us from not only feeling like we can say hello softly to the person on the other sidewalk, on the other side, if there even, even is a sidewalk, but um, we forget that we, we, we start to live in a linear way. Uh, not only in time and space, but with one another. And what, what Sophia was just saying about the elders and the children, a kitchen is a place that's intergenerational as well. It includes everybody. And so when we ask that, we love about this place, what do we, what do we um, feel a sense of belonging in this place for? We can also ask the question, who else belongs in this place? Who else needs to feel belonging in this in this place? Who else do we include in our everyday lives and in the way we gather together? And that brings us to gift because suddenly our places, our communities aren't just nests, but they become the actual tree that holds the nest. Um, mm. Again, being a little bit conceptual, but, but the ideas of, of gift that you and I spoke about, Michael, earlier this week actually came from the title the beautiful title that you've created for this webinar. I'll speak it again. Homecoming, Gifts, and Rootedness. Coming home to the wonder of a place-based world. Not just an idea, but the wonder of a place-based world. Mm -hmm. And when I was contemplating that title, the idea of a, a really deeply rooted oak tree came up in my mind. An oak tree is a tree that given the right conditions and, and, and space for its roots as well as for its branches, space for the soil around the roots to become spacious and full of life and alive um, so that, so that um, the soil and the roots and the upper part of the tree can all grow together. Um, an oak is a tree that can live for 800 years or more. And the idea of rootedness in place came to mind as the roots of our human being. And the idea of gifts felt like the branches that give us shelter or a perch to climb up to and play on or a really solid branch to go up and grieve on. Sometimes we climb into a tree as children, even as older persons, to weep, to grieve to go through a transformation. We can pick fruits that give us joy and nourishment and delight. And when we remember that we and the other human beings in our daily household, that's bigger than just the nest of our apartment or our house, when we remember that the different beings are made of clay, that we are sensory beings who need to feel the presence and the kindness of one another, the part of one another that we see is the fruit and the branch of a tree. And the sense of belonging that we feel with one another and our kindnesses and the spaces we make for each other, with the environment of our, of our neighborhoods, the environment of our homes, and the activities of our everyday lives, we deepen the roots of what we do and where we are and our connection with that, our relationship with that, and naturally start to bear branches and fruits. And those are the gifts of relationships in our everyday lives. And I think yeah. that brings to what Sophia was saying about how much of it is social capital, how much of it is design. They're interwoven like DNA, like the strands of DNA. They empower mm -hmm. each other. They, they gift each other. Yes. I hear you speaking about roots. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, we have a curriculum for how what it means to grow up and mature into the world, but we also need a curriculum for what it means to grow down mm -hmm. and become more rooted <laughs> in, in a place-based world. And that with roots, the roots have a correspondence with other adjoining roots. Trees will pass on their moisture <clears throat> from their own roots to another tree to, to support the growth of another tree without diminishing any of their own moisture. And so there's so much that happens beneath the ground that's invisible to us unless we take the time to kind of come home to, uh, to our own ground, <coughs> to our own community, to our own sense of self, to uh, our own kind of way of being, to our own gifts. 
I remember once being asked the question, who will play your music if you don't play it yourself? Because I was spending all my time <clears throat> playing other people's music, thinking that's what people wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. I had that invitation, you know, it's your music I want to hear. Who's going to play that if you don't play it yourself? And it came from a stranger one evening who had had quite a bit of wine to drink, and yet he had this marvelous moment of, of lucidity. And uh, I think that's the invitation is um, to come home to ourselves, is to come home to our own music, to our own experience, our own mm -hmm. life. <coughs> it's often something that we disconnect to as we kind of grow up. We grow up, out, in a sense, out of our own life into uh, what we think other people want to hear mm. by other people's music as we kind of grow up into the world. So it's a, mm. a sense of taking repossession in the sense of our of ourselves. And I'm just going to interject there, Michael, because I hear that there's quite a few people with their hands up that would like Wonderful. to speak. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so Christine. I'm going to call. There are a number of people with your hands up. We will try to get to everyone. Um, Diana, are you? I've unmuted you. Diana, are you there? Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an interesting talk. Um, and and one of the things um, that I was thinking about was, from your experience, do you think that um, in the like, can you ever even? Um, we're maybe we're all trying to search for um, what it means to kind of come home and find our roots. But in the very process, um, so let's say that we actually um, experience it at one time, and we try to replicate it in our communities. Do you think that in the very process of trying to replicate it, you actually disrupt that? that balance that you had once found? Mm, great question. Sophia, would you like to explore that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess from my experience, I feel like if it's done from an authentic place in a collaborative way that's tapping into a real need in a place and you listen to that call, like, is, is that actually what people are, are wanting and exploring that in a, in a real way that's thorough, that it, it doesn't have to be forced or switching direction or, um, yeah, feel inauthentic if it's done in, in that kind of collaborative, authentic way with storytelling and deep listening, that um, so much more can actually be possible that just needs to be uncovered. And I think of just so many cultures around the world and that we each culture has different social poverties and different um, areas of wealth. And I feel like in North America, one of ours is, is actually letting letting go of some of the structures and letting in um, some of the humanity and the connection and the ability to meet each other in authentic ways. Thank you. I, I think I'd like to add that um, I think that in finding our belonging, it doesn't necessarily need to come from the past. Um, for my way of thinking, replication rarely works. Because there's a there's a kind of an honor that we give the past for allowing it to give us belonging in its time and place. And there's another honor that we bring to the place and the people we're in and with now and here. And I think that again, coming back to relationship as the as the real dynamic of creating place, not a thing, but the, the relationships we build with one another and with the the plants, the animals, the water, the river, the soil, the streetscapes of the place that we're in, there's a real honor that we bring as we begin to help each other feel safe to belong to this place now. Mm. Does that make sense? We help create belonging in different places at different times in our lives, drawing from the past, but not necessarily feeling obliged to replicate it. I'd like to move on to another question. Thanks, Heidi. But just there's a, two lines that came from a beautiful poem by Seamus Heaney called Postscript. And he's writing about what it's like to be by the sea. So the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter and inland among stones, the surface of a slight gray lake is lit. Says, it's useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly, he says. It's useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly. There's so much of the sense of beauty of place that's captured in the moment. And as a pianist, knowing that uh, I can never repeat a performance, that the beauty I found at one time is almost impossible to replicate. Uh, it's something to grow out from and capture in a new way. But uh, when I think I can 
contain it and uh, and repeat it is often where I find I'm lost. So we move on to the next next moment of magic and creation. Christy, is there another? Mm -hmm, indeed. Um, Cameron Norman, I see your hand is raised. Let me unmute you here. Are you there, Cameron? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Yes, very clear. <laughs> Uh, just uh, Michael, Sophia, hi. It was just wonderful to hear uh, hear this this conversation. It's a very important one. You know, one of the things that it gets me to think about is is that is is in that challenge of design in creating these spaces. And I often find that too often we do this partly because of necessity after the fact. And it's we're trying to take very poorly designed environments, whether it's it's outside spaces or inside spaces, um, or even virtual spaces, and try and shoehorn opportunities in um, into there. And I, I guess I just want to get your thoughts on on or any observations of places. At the England the example from England is a very good one. Um, of other places that you've seen have done it fairly well um, intentionally from the beginning as opposed to doing it after the fact. Mm -hmm. Heidi, would you like to share a thought? And then we I'd like to move on to a few more questions too, if we could, before we close. But I wanted to um, respond back to this, this, this one as well. Yeah, this is such an important um, observation. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Did you? Would you like me to simply make a comment? Um, well, the Sure. Well, the question is mostly: Have you seen? Like, are there examples that you've seen where um, that you would hold up as, as places that have done this well, that have been able to create these spaces by design, um, rather than after the fact, like taking something that's been, um, like that you would say that you would build. If you were to build spaces for these, are they things that would um, that reflect you know, good practice or your best practice or ideal? Yeah. And and the oh this is such a wonderful wonderful conversation it's a whole series in itself but the the um, the sh I'm going to give two answers to that um, one is that the idea of the vernacular um, by that I mean the everyday sort of um, imagine. Imagine building a house and adding on an addition or a shed or um, a new angle of the roof or whatever as you discover that you need it in the way that used to be allowed, not having to necessarily go through um, complicated processes in, in order to make small adjustments to the needs of your everyday life or your family's everyday life. If there are there are vernacular and indigenous ways of growing um, uh, form, the form, of a neighborhood or a community out of the shape of the land, out of the, the, the where the soil is, where the rocks are, where the people want to live, how we want to interact. Um, we get into a whole lot of modern um, policy and um, approvals and process and cost issues when we get into this conversation. So the second part of the answer that I want to um, just give you ever, it's way too brief, I'm sorry Cameron, um, but we can discuss this offline. The, the, in order, it is possible to create places that are really living and really serve the relational needs of the human beings who want to live there, but the process needs to include different people. It needs to be a, a, a rich conversation. Um, and the transition movement is one of the, the um, English-based and North American now-based um, movements that is starting to surface all around the world on different continents. Um, and there are different practices um, that we don't have time to discuss right here. But I think the fundamental idea is that once again, we create a design process and a decision process when we're building a community or a neighborhood or a gathering, a public space or a street um, that includes voices that represent relationship and not just and the ability to sense one another's lives 
and presence in our everyday lives, and not just decisions that are based on exchanges of ideas or um, the needs of cost, insurance, and policy. And, and trickling up from the grassroots up, from those relationships, those very local relationships up, then we can open up, we can tease apart the policies and the rules to serve ourselves in daily life better rather than waiting for those things to change first. Am I making any sense? Well, yeah, thanks, I, mean, I, I wanted to, uh, sorry Cameron, I wanted to open an um, opportunity for one, of, one more question or reflections. Or do we have time, Christy? I know we're coming. Yeah, I think we probably have time for one more. We have a number of people who are uh, also sharing comments in the question box. So uh, I'll try and address okay. these offline. But we do have Debbie Hubbard. Um, Debbie, are you there? Debbie, hello. Hi there. Um, yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. Welcome. Um, I just want to say thank you. I find this um, conversation really interesting, and especially with some of the reconciliation work that we're doing across Canada with our Indigenous people. And just wanted to comment if any of you have done some work specifically looking at treaties and the meaning of treaty and what land meant in those treaties and what place made in the context of Indigenous spirituality and placemaking. That may be a question that we can look at next week, uh, which will be around reconciliation and placemaking. Okay. Uh, and so perhaps I, you could join us next week and bring that question forward next Friday. Yeah. That will be on June the 3rd. And thanks for bringing it forward here. And I think that because we're going to have four of us on a, in a conversation. Around Is there a moment? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I would like to just make one very brief comment. Um, at the beginning of the introduction, um, Christy mentioned that my purpose is to bring the people to the land. That purpose was actually voiced through one of the founders of Idle No More, Sylvia McAdam Sezi Wahum. And because of Sylvia and because of her communications and because of a very, very important book that she has created, not only to convey information, but to create protocol and a new way of listening and even reading through intellectual material in the form of that book. Um, the question that you're asking and the content that it refers to is something that I am looking very, very deeply at. And I know that um, Michael is also looking at that, and Sophia as well in their work. It's a uh, it's a work in progress, and it's an extremely important top priority in the way that I am trying to answer the question, how to bring the people to the land. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, hi, Heidi. Sophia, I know we're coming to a close. I wanted to open a space for you for any closing reflection. Mm. Oh, it's just been so rich. I love that you know, it was a bit of an experiment, like how can we have a conversation around this topic and invite others to it? and I'm just really grateful to to be in this rich space and excited to join the next ones as well whenever I can. Uh, yeah, I'd love to continue. If there's a way that we can continue these conversations around place and placemaking and belonging and, and how we actually find our way home, uh, I'd love to be in that. So thanks for hosting, Michael, and nice to meet you all. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, I'm Thank very you. grateful for all of you that have joined us today as well and uh, know that these are just the beginnings of an ongoing conversation. Uh, and I think while there's a beginning to a conversation, there's not an end to it. And we create places through the conversations we have a place. And as Heidi said, I think there's a vernacular language, a language that comes from the roots up rather than from the top down. And our places, I think, are created out of the, out of the sense of what, what wants to give be given expression to in our community. Um, hi, Christy, do we have a moment for Heidi to also have a closing reflection, or is there more you want to do with the call? Yeah, sure, I do. I would like to close the call, but certainly, Heidi, if you'd like to share some final thoughts, that would be wonderful. Wow, um, we've only just opened <laughs> so many beautiful questions, and I know there's an audience full of engagement. Um, I would be so happy to continue conversations and explorations both through idea and dialogue and through creating sensory physical dialogues in our um, 
communities offline with this group and, and growing, growing our conversation and our community. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. Let's keep asking questions and moving it into form. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael, Sophie, and Heidi, for sharing your insights and perspectives with us on the call today. And thanks, all of you, for joining us. I see Paul, Ian, Ben, Carla, um, so many wonderful questions that have come up. My uh, Twitter has been exploding. There's so many great things. And I really would love to continue having this conversation uh, with you all and sharing. Debbie, um, I'd love for you to send me more information about the work that you're doing and find ways that we can continue this dialogue and sharing uh, resources and information, um, especially through our site at www.deepeningcommunity.ca. Um, I would like to remind you all that we will email you out uh, the links to the audio and other material related to today's call in a few days. Um, I would love to include as many resources that are emerging um, out of these calls online. So please email me, everyone, with, um, with your links. Um, we also uh, encourage you, as Michael mentioned, um, to register for next week's call. Again, this is just the first part of a four-part series. And the next session on Friday is called Regenerativity, Resilience and Renewal, Placemaking and Reconciliation on Friday, uh, June 3rd from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, that's Eastern time. And on this call, Michael will be joined by Erin Dixon of the Ontario Provincial Police Aboriginal Awareness Unit Community Initiatives, as well as Catherine Twin, who's a lawyer and mediator from Slave Lake, Alberta, and Bill Phipps, past moderator with the United Church of Canada. We are also so excited to continue uh, this learning in Edmonton for all of you uh, in the West. Catherine Twin and Erin Dixon will also be joining us. Uh, certainly Michael in spirit, um, and this is a national gathering, a uh, deepening community national gathering from June 7th to 9th in Edmonton, and we welcome you to look at the event site for that. Finally, we have some other exciting events coming up, and we encourage you to visit our website, uh, tamarackcommunity.ca, to learn more and sign up for our monthly e-magazine Engage. Again, thank you all so much for joining us on the call today. Um, that was really powerful, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Have a wonderful day, everyone.